This week, we talked to Father Robert Balasar, who was at Oculus Connect. We also check in with Jason Snell from Macworld about the future of Apple TV. And Mike Murphy is here to speak with us about his digital doppelganger. Is it more interesting than he is? We'll find out on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Weekly, episode two, recorded Thursday, October 12th, 2017. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is the show where we talk to and about the people making and breaking the news. <sighs> making and breaking it. I'm Megan Maroney. And I'm Jason Howell. And I don't know who this guy is next to us that crashed the party. Uh, this is... This is Jamba Juice, right? I mean, was that, that was, that yeah, was right. Juice. Dang, you came to the wrong oh, store. This is Tech News Weekly, the store. Oh, that's next door. Oh, yes. Got it, got it. Exactly. Yeah. We carry Jamba Juice items from time to time, though. <laughs> well, you know, I, I just need myself some, some. what is that, the pina colada stuff? Oh, I don't know. I never go to Jamba Juice, to be honest. Um, but it's great to have you here. Thanks, Thanks for thank hopping you for in. Having, oh, episode two. I like this. My, yeah. You know, I was on Tech News Today, Tech News Tonight, and now Tech News Weekly. I got all the Tech News down. <laughs> all the iterations. All right. And you're breaking the news, breaking I, it all I, over the it's place. It's so broken. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is busted into a million pieces because of the Oculus event. That's right. Facebook's Oculus Connect conference uh, is actually underway right now in San Jose, California. The company unveiled a laundry list of new hardware and features during its keynote yesterday morning. Uh, Father Robert, you were there at the event. You got a firsthand glimpse of some of the new kind of devices, new initiatives, all that stuff, games, I hope. Yes, yes. Now, it, it was interesting because they had all that. I mean, they had everything you expect out of a VR conference. They had new hardware, some of which, which is fantastic and I think is going to make a big impact. Yeah. They also had some new software, a couple of new services. But I think the big news, and the one that's really gone unreported, is this tone shift. I mean, you heard it from the moment Mark Zuckerberg walked onto stage. VR had been all about the titles, had been all about the games, been all about the beautiful graphics that you can get. But if you look through that keynote, games were mentioned only in passing. I mean, it was a splash screen, but they really were pushing this narrative that VR is more than just games. And I actually think that's very positive. I mean, you know, we've heard Facebook and Spaces mm -hmm. uh, as an avenue of this um, kind of, you know, pulling VR away from being just an entertainment medium, but potentially the next phase of social media did you have you checked out spaces before this event not um, before this event I, I did have a, a chance to actually put on a headset and, and take a look it's nice and yeah. remember there, there was this line that zuckerberg used he said most people think that vr is antisocial or for antisocial people and he said but i very much disagree because vr when done right can bring people into a space that makes them feel more comfortable and when do you have those honest conversations it's when you feel more comfortable and this is this is what we're seeing on the screen right now it's 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 a social area it's a mm -hmm. place where i can go in with a couple of my friends i can don my avatar and just hang out it's not a game it's not a, a content experience it's, it's literally a, a hangout this is a chat room but in vr now it was interesting, but I mean, I didn't know anybody else, so it, I wasn't really taking advantage of the functions of spaces. Uh, but I can see the promise of the technology. Mm -hmm. So they had, uh, they weren't talking about games, they were talking about social stuff, which is still like a form of entertainment. Right, were right. they talking about enterprise stuff, VR uses at all? Yeah, they, they, they broke it down. And again, this, this goes into that whole trend of not really pitching it towards gaming. They talked a lot about medical, how you they've been using VR to treat soldiers with PTSD. They were talking about educational, how especially with the new low-priced hardware, you have the ability to have virtual classrooms. Uh, they were talking about social, and for me, because I'm more of an enterprise guy, the big thing was VR for business, Oculus for business, enterprise. Um, now, with this, you get a full VR license, uh, you get an enterprise-grade warranty, you get dedicated customer support, uh, you get kits that allow you to, as an enterprise, as a company, to deploy or your customers. So this this is not VR as a recreational unit for the consumer. 
this is VR for a car dealership that wants to set up a bunch of headsets so that you could try on the car and see what colors you like. Uh, this is for, um, you know, a- uh, Real say, estate, maybe? Real estate, exactly. So all of those business cases where you can think of people building something in a virtual space and then buying something for real, that's what the enterprise version of the product is based for. Uh, hmm. And, you know, I got to say, that's a great pitch. Uh, if, if I, as a company, can go to you as a retailer or an enterprise and say, what if I gave you a piece of technology that could increase your sales 30%? That's a no-brainer. Uh, and that's what Zuckerberg's trying to do. Hmm. And were people buying it? Like, was this, I mean, not buying it, like spending money for it, but be, were people like drinking the Kool-Aid at Oculus Connect or were, is everyone kind of like feeling, oh, ah, is this really the future we thought it was going to be? That, that was kind of weird. During, during that keynote, there were, you know, the, the regular applause breaks. Um, I don't think they had professional clappers. So there, there was some natural enthusiasm. Uh, I was sitting in the press area and of course the press is pretty jaded. So not a whole <laughs> lot of applause from there, but from the developers I could hear behind me, especially when he announced VR enterprise, VR for business, mm. there was a gasp and it was like, oh yeah. And I think that's what that gasp was, was a realization of, yes, we need to develop for that because that's money. You know, if I develop right. an app and a couple of thousand people buy it because it's an entertaining app, that's one thing. If I develop something that a business can use, then that is a huge revenue stream. So I, from the developer side, that absolutely makes sense. Now you got to have some hands-on time with uh, definitely a few things that I'm very that I've been very curious about. Probably at the top of my curiosity list is what we heard about a year ago, mm -hmm. Project Santa Cruz, and uh, you got at least a little bit of time with that, right? I, Tell I us got about some time. That. Um, I, uh, by the way. I, I won't say your name because I know you'll get in trouble. Thank you for letting me in. I did not have an appointment. <laughs> I just, I, I did the tie, the tried and true uh, method of standing around and looking pathetic until she mm. said, okay, come on. Uh, so I, I got some head time with this. It's phenomenal because I've tried the old Oculus and you know, it's nice, but it's a little clunky. I mean, it had good tracking, but of course you didn't really have good positioning of any of the sensors. This was spot on. Well, and the Santa Cruz is the kind of like wireless inside out tracking Precisely. version of Oculus. Right. So rather than putting sensors on the corners or yeah. up on a pole like the HTC Vive, you've got four sensors built into the corners of the headset itself. Now, it's such a wide view that you can actually do things behind wow. you and the sensors will still pick it up. And it was rock solid. I mean, it, this is exactly what you want not just because it's so precise with the sensors, but because it's standalone. There's no tether. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's one of the most annoying things of doing a VR setup, which is you, you can have a suspension of disbelief until the headset gets yanked off your head because you move three feet. This is entirely self-contained and it was beautiful, it was gorgeous. My question though, and, and she kind of smiled and said, uh, I can't tell you that, was how long is it gonna last? You've got a high powered right, PC that's a big question. built into the headset, she wouldn't tell me how long the batteries last. She wouldn't even tell me what the capacity of the batteries were. Uh, but but I have to say, this thing felt light. And in fact, on my head, it felt lighter than the original Oculus Rift. Hmm. Um, so that's that's good. There's there's definitely some engineering that needs to be done. But the controller was spot on. The the display looked really good, and the sensors were accurate. So they're they're close. Computing isn't happening in there. It's still happening on a computer. It's just zapping that video it's over. Wireless, Is that right? right? It's right. Okay. Well, yeah, because uh, if you tried to put the entire computer in the right. headset. Uh, it wouldn't really do anything. That's next to next generation. That's super, super, super <laughs> yeah. next. Super duper next generation. Uh, you also got some uh, limited exposure time with the Oculus Go. Yes. Now this was, that? this was more of a model. This thing wasn't even working. Uh, actually, it might've been working, but they didn't let me turn it on. Um, shipping early 2018, just like Project Santa Cruz, $199. And that was the big buzz. This is the, the VR headset for everyone else. Now, this is entirely self-contained. This is sort of like putting your phone there, but the hardware is built in. Right. And the hardware actually looks pretty good. Non-glare wild field optics, which is what you need because you, you you can have all the great hardware you, you want, but if the optics aren't good, it looks horrible. A WQHD 2560 by 1440 LCD. Spatial nice. audio, which is awesome because that means that you can, uh, you can do 3D sound as well as 3D visuals. And it's also binary compatible with Rift and Gear VR. So th that's obviously the phasing out of the Gear VR. They want to get rid of the Samsung partnership and say, this is the new low cost headset. And at $200, that's it. I mean, it, it's wonderful. Uh, you wouldn't want a game on this, but if you are buying into the social, if you're buying into the educational, if you're buying into the medical, this is actually a really, really good solution. And it's at the right price point. 
So it's not fast enough for gaming? No, no. Uh, this is, again, this is a standalone system. Uh, you, you just couldn't do it. I mean, you could do light gaming. You could do, you know, uh, just... Pro yeah, probably in gaming. the same sense as like mobile VR, like Daydream or something. Precisely, precisely. Yeah, yeah it's, it would be a good technology demonstrator. But And, and th there were some subtle clues during the keynote. This I really kind of like. This is sort of inside baseball. The, um, the demo screen that they showed for their social... Uh, they mentioned that, oh, yeah, and by the way, you can play old console games. They actually had, like, a, a room with the old consoles that you could plug in Atari cartridges or Nintendo cartridges. That's exactly, that's straight out of Ready Player One. That, I mean, that's mm -hmm. literally, that is a scene from Ready Player One. There's a basement uh, that H has where with all the old consoles, and you can plug them in. So mm -hmm. it's it's like, okay, that's, they're trying to evoke that. It's a popular thing right now. Uh, even the target that they said, they wanted one billion users on VR, it sort of leads to a world where everyone has a VR headset. And this is the starter VR headset, and it's affordable. So why not get it? Right, because we're just prepping for destroying our entire planet, right? Right, so exactly. That's all we have. Yeah, you know, awesome. we, won't, we won't have any space. All we'll need is a, is a goggle. I'll just have my little cubicle. I'll yeah, lie down all day closet. with a headset. And wireless <laughs> charging. What else do I need? Because, I mean, no spoilers, but Ready Player One, the world is not so great. No, the no. The actual world. Although uh, the 80s references were awesome, so... <laughs> Live in the 80s. That. Right, but in, inside the, the virtual reality was great. Right, right, right. And now, the other thing about this, about the Go and about this side of the VR presentation is I think it sounds like it's a direct response to what we're hearing in tech journalism these days, which is VR is a dead end. I've heard that more than once. Yeah. Leo has said it. I said it. I don't really think it's a dead, dead end. But, I mean, when you look at the utility of VR versus AR, augmented rea reality, AR seems to be so much more useful, right? I mean, if I can overlay things on the real world, that's better than me just closing myself off from the world. They wanted to push back at that. And they, and they even used a term that started in the AR world, mixed reality. Well, mixed reality in the Microsoft world is something like the HoloLens. Mixed reality in the Facebook world, the Oculus world, is bringing real objects into the virtual world. So it's, it's sort of the other way around. Um, and they're really doing this push of saying it's not a dead-end technology, it's just a different technology. So what about the Dash UI? What, what did you learn about that? Um, okay, this might be one of the most useless features and one of the features <laughs> that I absolutely want right now. It's, it's, I don't need it. You, no one needs the Dash. No, absolutely not. It's just a way to kick things off, but it's cool. It is so cool. The ability to have everything that you use, say Twitter, Facebook, uh, all your applications, in virtual monitors that hover in front of you. Uh, it, you know, you feel like you're on the bridge of some futuristic starship. And it really does. Just And as we're sitting in the demo right now, it really feels like that. The only thing you don't have is that tactile touch. But if they, if they improve the haptics on the controllers, it'll start to feel like that. The dash is supposed to be where you start. You, you don the headset and this is the start of your Ready Player One experience. Um, and it's actually really well designed. <laughs> Interesting. So, okay, so, it, I mean, you know, there were a lot of announcements. What about games? So did you have a chance to yeah. see any games that blew your mind? Yeah, okay, so there was uh, there was a lot of games. And unfortunately, and I'm really sorry uh, for the, the folks who um, who let me play with this, uh, the Wind Walkers 2, um, uh, it was amazing. So imagine being Spider-Man. So this is me. I just started. That looks fine. And so it's a, a grappling. Now, by the way, this got me motion sick to no end because, and again, I'm sorry, because I had played like five other games right before this and I was already a little woozy. I could only play oh. this for about 10 minutes. Oh, oh my God. I go, man. Yeah, this is this would yeah. totally If you've ever you wanted to be Spider-Man or if you've ever wanted to be a, an attack on Titan with a little, uh, the little mobility packs, that's what this felt like. It, it feels like a mashup of The Legend of Zelda with a, a more modern shooter. And it's, you know, beautifully rendered world, but they deliberately left it cartoony because yeah. they wanted to have that sort of Zelda slash Final Fantasy feel. Okay. Um, it, it took me all of 30 seconds to learn the control system, uh, and then I was off. And if, if I wasn't about to fall out of my chair, I would have continued to play this thing as long as they let me. Uh, it, it does have that, that sort of swooping motion. So if you do get motion sick, you will get motion sick, but it is beautifully rendered. Hmm. Uh, it, they say that's going to be released about uh, sometime in 2018. They want to incorporate some of the features that were announced at the Oculus event. Like, for example, custom avatars. Um, one of the things that was included in the keynote was this idea of moving VR objects between different systems. 
So I can create a custom avatar. That's me. I can take that avatar out of the VR game and put it as my Facebook avatar, which is now 3D enabled so people can move it and poke it. Or I could put it into AR. So now that avatar exists in the real world with a mixed reality slash HoloLens type product. Mm -hmm. Or I could 3D print it. They, they really want to emphasize that any work a developer does in this new Oculus world is portable. Uh, and that is a great news for developer because it means I could create something and now it's not just that platform, it's anything that platform is compatible with. Yeah, and I think that's a big growing kind of uh, concern is that you have all these different platforms, certain things you want to be able to be portable because it's, it's kind of a pain in the butt to have to start from scratch every single time. Right, right. All these different things. Now, now for the people who want to do standard gaming, they also did announce one thing that's, that's kind of important, and that is the permanent price move of the Rift yes, Bundle. Yes, right. So the Rift Bundle, of course, comes with two controllers, sensors, six apps. That used to be $499. That's now permanently $399. That's not a special deal. That's going to be forever. Uh, and, you know, with the coming of the Go and Project Santa Cruz, they now kind of have their lineup. I, I think the, the VR, Gear VR is going to go away, uh, or not entirely because people still have phones. But on the low end, you've got the Go and the VR, then you've got the Rift, and then you've got Project Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a really nice product line because it's everything from casual, which is you go with the Go, to Extreme Gamer, which is you go with Project Santa Cruz. And this is all opening up. Basically, 2018 is the year where all this is going to kind of explode. Right, right. And, and the developers just heard about the new features yesterday. So it's mm -hmm. going to take them a while to, to bring them in. Oh, by the way, speaking of developers, if you are a developer, they've given you more tools. One of the big things about VR is frame drop. So when things get too busy, the GPU and the CPU can't keep up, and mm -hmm. so it starts dropping frames. That is one of the main reasons why people get sick, because the brain just... It doesn't like the fact that there's a yeah, jarring it gets, it gets patchy. Yeah, it gets, gets very it, patchy. Yeah. So they're actually giving people a tool that used to only exist once you submitted your app to, uh, to Oculus. It used to be that when you were done with the development, you could give them the app, and then they would tell you, oh, you're dropping frames here, 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 and here. They now have a tool that you can download, put on your development platform, and it will tell you exactly when you're dropping frames so you can go into that part of your app and say, I need to reduce the busyness or mm -hmm. let's reduce the textures to keep that, that nice, smooth flow. Uh, and they're doing so much work with figuring out how the brain actually perceives VR. Uh, I think that's, uh, again, the geeky side of me is looking at that and saying, I, I want someone to study that because it's not just putting pictures and sound, it's making the two mesh up. The closer you get to mimicking how it actually works in the real world and understanding how the brain interprets that, the more I'm gonna have a good experience. Yeah, right on. Father Robert Balasser spent all day playing with the Oculus Rift and I all did. associated hardware and games. And we job. appreciate your hard work, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I had exactly. a really weird job. <laughs> Wish I could have been there. I was supposed to uh, supposed to go. Had to had to bow out. So thank you for for doing that and coming on, and telling us all about it. Well, thank you for bowing bow, buying out and let me uh, go down there. It's <laughs> kind of fun. I mean, seriously, it was it was a day of uh, the keynote was fascinating. Yeah, and then just to be able to walk around and see hardware that hasn't yet been released, to, to try games that won't be released for one to two years, and to, to see people who have grown up developing for this, see them excited. When I see developers that are excited, I know something good is coming. Yeah, we'll check this out. Um, actually, this next story is totally related. We might as well keep you around for this. What's mm -hmm. the story? Right. Uh, in this week's Tone Deaf Tech News, Mark Zuckerberg live-streamed a virtual version of himself in front of the devastation in Puerto Rico, saying it felt like he was really there. Uh, then cartoon versions of him and another Facebook employee high-fived. Uh, Zuckerberg then saw how terrible this looked and apologized, saying that his goal was to, quote, raise awareness and help us see what's happening in different parts of the world so yeah this was one of those things where it's like what do you have any idea what you look like there yeah um so yeah what do you think this of is one of those uh it was a good idea at first it may have seemed like a good idea on paper <laughs> I'm, I'm just really amazed because i mean mark zuckerberg has i'm sure a team manicuring his yeah. his pr and manicuring his image how they never kind of thought of the idea of a cartoon placed on top of video of devastation so toned up and uh you know from that perspective like maybe when you're on the inside of the experience you don't understand that how it looks on the outside but somebody should have recognized that. right and the thing is you can't even make the excuse that well they didn't know what was being put up behind them because that was actually one of the announcements that's a new feature 
they they for people who play games in VR because what happens when you play a game in VR? You think it's cool. Yeah. Everyone watching you goes, "You look like an idiot. You're just flailing your arms." Yeah. There's now a way to have a monitor that shows you inside, so they can see what you see and they can see what you look like in that world. The, obviously, they had that tech running, and you, you got to be thinking, Mark, optics. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've heard that word so many times. Optics. If you had just done a VR display of some of the most ravaged areas of Puerto Rico, I think that would have been beneficial. Because, yeah, people can sit there and go, oh, my goodness, I had no idea it actually looked like this. If you had a cartoony thing of people talking about the challenges of Puerto Rico, people would be, okay, you know, it's like a podcast. Yeah. You put the two together, that is not a good thing. Uh, and someone someone should have seen this on that new feature and said, no, we're shutting this down. No, yeah. don't kill it. Sorry. No, bad. Um, it's, it's just, oh. It, because you can do something doesn't mean you should. <laughs> <laughs> That's technology in a nutshell. Um, the newly announced Google Home Mini has been in the hands and homes of many journalists since it was announced last week. Artem Rezikovsky at Android Police noticed soon after uh, receiving his device and setting it up in his home that the device was waking up and recording audio in the room thousands of times per day. All of that audio, of course, is being backed up on Google's servers in his My Activity portal. You can get there. We all know that that audio is cataloged there. If you didn't know, you should definitely check it out. Google jumped on the case to investigate immediately and narrowed the issue to the touch panel and activation on the top of the device that allows for bypassing the hot word. The glitch created phantom touches, essentially. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, Google annou has announced now that it is permanently removing the top touch functionality from all Google Home Minis once they release into con consumers' hands. So because of this issue, they're saying, well, we're taking that feature out entirely, which is interesting because on the Echo Dot, you have the touch to, to fire off commands, right? Uh, I don't or think is it so. all voice activated on the Echo It's Dot? all voice activated. Oh, okay. Then that's that's probably part of it then. No harm, no foul. Uh, this, this is actually a typical problem with touch because touch is taking advantage of your fingers interrupting an electromagnetic field. Well, on devices like what we've got, they're expensive enough and they're well designed enough where they they can uh, uh, they can take that out they can yeah. es essentially remove that input on a device as small and as inexpensive as those minis you they didn't really do that and so you take that and you take it out of the lab out of it out of a perfect environment into an imperfect environment let it age let it get dirty and grimy and suddenly all that input becomes phantom input mm. um and yeah that's just not good i mean that's that's the reason why I, I don't have any of the assistants running. All of my assistants shut off when I'm not using them actively just because I know stuff like that happens. I don't think it's malicious, but at the same time, I don't care if it's malicious. I don't want that anywhere else but in my room, in my head. Thousands of times a day is basically yeah. the whole day. <laughs> so. Exactly right. It's like there's, that, that's not, there's not much time in a day. You don't want all that audio hanging out on Google servers. No. Yeah. I mean, I, I am almost 100% positive that any of the Echo devices don't have, they have a button that you can turn off so that it doesn't listen to you at all. Ah, uh, okay. Um, that's but the there's that no I way to turn okay. off so that it just listens without the wake word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no way to do that. Um, I mean, there's not to say that it wouldn't just mm -hmm. listen to you without the wake. I mean, it has to be listening in order to hear the wake Word, yeah. but yeah, I mean, this is really just the worst nightmare, especially giving it giving it to journalists. That's the worst part, well. right? You know, just like that. Yeah. That's that's pretty bad. I, I do think though that this is going to lead to a new product category. Um, all of these assistants right now they are taking advantage of the wonderful economy of scale of the cloud. I can have a relatively simple device that uses the power of the cloud to do things like natural speech processing and textual analysis things that I couldn't do on my small device because it's not powerful enough. Eventually, there's going to be a demand for devices that can do that all in the unit. Because if I can do it in the unit, it means I send nothing to the cloud but the request for the data that's been asked for. That is sort of the holy grail. It means Google doesn't have a server somewhere or Apple doesn't have a server somewhere that has hours of me talking, asking for requests, which yeah. by the way, if you go to history.google.com, you can find all of yours right now. You can see exactly what has been recorded. I want to see yours. No, uh, <laughs> you really don't. It's mostly Google no, Is there a Taco Bell near me? Uh, but, but, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I just set that off. You I, did, you I, did. Wow, I, I do apologize. I'll put, I'll put a dollar in the, in the assistant in the jar. jar. <laughs> yeah. That's our swear jar. That's our yeah. swear jar. But, Eventually, we will get to the point where power is so inexpensive that I can have a unit. We're gonna, I, I'm betting we're going to start seeing these in things like uh, security assistance first, yeah. where there's enough processing power, enough battery power, where it can do all the processing. It only goes to the cloud when it has the finished query. Uh, and that, when you start to see those, people will say, 
Yeah, that's that's what, that's what needs to that's happen, and that's what Google's doing with its Clips camera. Yep. All the AI yep. is on board. Uh, now, mind you, it's doing a lot. I mean, you know, it's doing different computational right. work, probably not to the level that these fully featured AI assistants are doing, but we'll get there. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We'll I mean, seriously. And we needed something else to, to keep making us build faster hardware. This is yeah. this is a good reason. There you go. Father Robert Ballester, thanks for dropping in with us. Uh, Thank you for having today. me. It's really just, appreciate it. This is a lot of fun. Uh, Twit.tv slash KH. Slash KH. And actually, if you go to Twit.tv slash KH, Megan and I, this morning, we were there... Uh, Hooking up a skull. Mm -hmm. Hooking up mm. a skull. I'm not even going to explain that. If you want to find out what that's about, you go watch. Twit.tv slash KH. It was not a human skull. No. Well, <laughs> not now. <laughs> this week, Apple inked a deal with Steven Spielberg's Amblin Television and Universal Television to create new episodes of a sci-fi and horror anthology series from the 80s called Amazing Stories. Our next guest says it was inevitable that Apple would begin hiring big name talent for its push into original programming. Joining us to talk about the Spielberg deal and Apple's rumored upcoming video service is Jason Snell, a columnist at Macworld and a writer at sixcolors.com. Welcome to the show, Jason. Hi, thanks for having me. Good to be here. So let's start with uh, money. The Wall Street Journal says Apple will have a million dollar budget for original programming. How does that compare with like Netflix or Hulu or other creators of their own streaming video? Well, so Apple's going to have a billion dollar checkbook, billion with a B. Billion. Oh, I said yes. million. Yeah, billion. <laughs> okay. uh, one, I, would, I would take a million. That would not get you very far. A uh, billion dollars. Netflix is the is the good example. Netflix has said that in next year they're going to spend seven billion dollars on content, and this year they spent six billion. Now that's not all original content that includes netflix originals worldwide it also includes all the stuff they license so the reruns and and old older movies and older tv shows they they have to pay for those too and that's in that budget but still six seven billion dollars it's a lot of money and then apple is going to apparently launch their service they're starting small only one measly billion one measly, and I, I would have given mm. them a million. I would have done it for a million, Apple. That's just, you could have had this show for a million. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> that's, a, that's how they got Planet of the Apps, I think. Is the <laughs> yeah, yeah that's something that's like that, for sure. Yeah, and Carpool Karaoke, also uh, Tepid Reviews. Do you like either of those shows? Uh, I got to be honest, I saw about 10 minutes of Planet of the Apps and I had to run away and I have not seen Carpool Karaoke at all. I think the timeline here is important, though. Those shows were in development for a while. They kind of came out of, uh, the people who were doing Apple Music and they wanted to do, sort of experiment with video stuff. But in June, Apple hired two really well-respected execs who who worked at Sony, um, the good part of Sony, the Sony TV production team that was is really highly respected. And uh, Zach Van Amberg and Jamie... Uh, Sternlicht, I think is his name. And they, uh, they've they hired a bunch of other people. They've got an office in Culver City, so in LA. They know everybody. And they, they were not responsible for Planet of the Apps and Carpool Karaoke going on, on Apple Music. This is like, this is Apple saying, no, we're going to actually do this like a TV network or a streaming service and have legit Hollywood executives who know everybody and they're going to take meetings and they're going to make uh, offers and Apple made an offer for Ryan Murphy's new show and got outbid by Netflix. And now by this account, they uh, made an offer for amazing stories and they, they won that one. And that, th you know, that's at a budget of 5 million an episode uh, for f 10 episodes, you know, that's 50 million. They could buy 19 more of those if they wanted to, and they won't do that probably, but they are going to, uh, you know, this is the first of a big wave of deals that they're going to make most of them or many of them with names that we know as TV and entertainment industry watchers. And that's part of the strategy, I think, is for Apple to say, no, we're serious about this. Steven Spielberg here and maybe they'll get Zach Gilligan from Breaking Bad involved in something. And maybe they'll get, you know, some other creator, they'll get Mike Schur, who does The Good Place and Parks and Recreation to do something for them. Who knows what the names will be? But this is just the first of a whole string of recognizable, legitimate creators, creative talent in Hollywood that Apple's going to sign with that uh, billion dollar checkbook. Yeah, I mean, in the in the kind of pool, the collection of franchises that are ripe for the, you know, reimagined uh, revival uh, sort of thing. And amazing Stories is not necessarily at the top of my list. Or, or, no. or should it have been? Like, is it, uh, this seems to be obviously much more about Spielberg than it is about the s series itself. But the series still needs to stand on its own two feet. 
Yeah, it's not a super expensive series. It's an anthology, which means I think anthologies right now are kind of an interesting thing. Uh, HBO is doing one. Of course, Black Mirror, yeah, maybe the best yeah. high profile example on Netflix. So amazing stories. I think maybe that's probably the pitch is this is a modern take on the Twilight Zone. They're all takes on the Twilight Zone, essentially. Right. Yeah. This is a modern take on that. That is going to be using some brand recognition from amazing stories. I'm surprised that CBS All Access hasn't already announced that the Twilight Zone is coming back because they should totally do that. Um, you only have to pay actors for the for you know they come in for one episode and then they go away again. Um, but this is the, this yeah it's the start. Uh, one of the challenges is who owns the franchises. Like I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a, a you know a Star Wars series and it was on Apple? But I think ABC and Disney are going to reserve that for the Disney streaming service that they're launching next year because everybody's got a streaming service now. So it's definitely it would behoove Apple if they could find some franchise some recognizable names uh but you know at recognizable actor names or writer names and producer names will also do it in terms of giving them credibility so we don't know a lot of details about this service but i mean is there will people will will jason be able to get this on his android phone i mean i know yeah, what, about get, jason? yeah what, about, what about jason yeah what about jason i mean i know i'll get it on my iphone my ipad my apple tv uh but what about anyone who's not in that ecosystem will they also be able to subscribe do you think this is one of those 10 burning questions about Apple's video service. I, I, and talking to people this week, just, just people who know Apple and, and, and just sort of speculate, nobody knows. They have not announced that. In fact, that is one of the arguments about um, how hard it is for Apple to make deals right now is that a lot of these creators, I mean, they want the money, right? But they also want to know where their show is going. And we don't know what this service is. My gut feeling is that it'll be Apple devices only. Even though Apple wants to boost its services revenue, I think the services revenue line that they keep wanting to grow is a part of a larger story, which is Apple's hardware business. And they want to also encourage people to buy Apple hardware. So my guess is that there's going to be some show and you're going to be like, oh, I really want to see that show. And maybe it's not amazing stories, but it'll be something. And the, the answer is going to be instead of, yeah, you're going to have to pay $10 a month. It's going to be, yeah, you have to buy an Apple TV. And then you get Apple TV for like three months for free. And then you have to pay $10 a month for that too. But if I had to bet, I don't think it's like a sure thing, but if I had to bet, it would be that this would be only on the only streamer box this would be on would be Apple TV. It would be on all the iOS stuff and on Macs and presumably uh, even on Windows PCs through iTunes, maybe. Uh, but I don't think it would be on Android. It's possible, but if I had to bet, I would say no. I would say it will just be on Apple devices. Planet of the Apps, that's only... that's like you can't get that through the Apple Music app on Android? Is so there's right? an Apple Music app on Android. And the yeah. question is, is that is that just because they had it for Beats Music and they decided to turn it over? Um, it, it's a good question, though. Is the existence of an Android app for Apple Music a sign that Apple strategically wants to be on some other platforms with their services? I'm not sure because there was a Beats Music app for Android and they may just have decided it was easier to keep maintaining it. Um, but it's a good question, right? I mean, they, if they want to maximize services revenue, they should put this everywhere because like Netflix, you want to be everywhere so that anybody who wants to see a given show can just pay you money and watch that show. But Apple also wants to sell you an Apple TV and an iPad and a Mac. And so those two things, uh, they have to balance. And and that that's a, one of the real questions is which side will they come down on? I think it's more likely than not it'll be on the hardware side, but it's not impossible that they might they might come out and say, no, we're going to be on other devices too. We got to deal with these TV manufacturers. We got to, you know, we our deal with Amazon includes, you know, we'll put our service on their boxes just like they're on ours. Who knows? It's possible, but I think it's just less likely. Yeah, I mean, this whole original content kind of um, you know, trend that's happening right now, Netflix obviously is proving that they're really good at doing the original content thing. They're kind of the model in this new age. Uh, Amazon seems to, I mean, they've got a lot going on as well, but from the original content standpoint, there's good stuff there, but it doesn't resonate nearly as well as it seems to on Netflix. Um, how can Apple avoid... It being Amazon in this equation and ensure that they succeed the way Netflix is? Well, some of it is a crapshoot because it's about buying a quality show. And if you knew what the quality hit That's show true. was going to be, it's like HBO developing five Game of Thrones spinoffs. It will, if it was easy... Uh, 
there was a report a few weeks ago that Jeff Bezos went to the TV people at Amazon and basically said, I want, uh, I want the next Game of Thrones to be an Amazon show. And it's like, everybody wants the next Game of Thrones to be <laughs> their show, right? And it's not that easy to do that. And so some of it is luck. Some of it is leadership. Like what kinds of shows does Netflix produce? What kinds of shows does Amazon produce? And what kinds of shows does Apple want to produce? Did, does Apple want to be more family friendly? Does it want to be more like HBO? Does it want to be like Netflix and have a lot of different kind of stuff or does it want to be prestige um and and the shows the hits can come from anywhere like a uh, great example is the handmaid's tale which is on hulu and it won the best drama uh, emmy a couple of weeks ago and that that's the first streaming service uh or that that's netflix got shut out um and that's the first streaming service to win a best drama emmy right amazon won comedy for transparent i think mm -hmm. maybe but it's it's one of these examples where you don't have to be netflix uh you and, and amazon may yet get there mm -hmm. um but it, there's some luck involved too and 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 leadership like what have tim cook and eddie q told the guys in culver city who are the their their people in hollywood that about the identity of this thing and how it's going to be sold and what have they agreed to because that will determine in part how they pitch it to creators and what kind of stuff they buy and that's the stuff we don't know yet although i suspect unlike most apple products which tend to leak from the uh, supply chain in asia um i think all the leaks here will will be coming out of hollywood and there'll be lots of them because hollywood is where industry gossip started <laughs> so when apple tells a creator uh what they're planning we will know immediately, which is why I think they're being kind of coy. But at some point, they're going to need to talk because they're going to need to convince some big creator to come to them as an unknown quantity instead of going to Netflix or FX or HBO. So so I've given up my idea that there's a perfect skinny bundle out there for me. But what about the your article? You talk about the Uber bundle, which does not, in fact, include Uber. What is the no. Uber <laughs> bundle? Well, I think the question, the big mystery of the Uber bundle is Apple. Like, would Apple, so Amazon Prime is the example here. I'm trying to find analogs, right? Is this like YouTube Red? Is this like Netflix? And, it, you know, because YouTube Red is going to apparently bundle in uh, Google Play Music at some point into a single service. Right now, nobody is is doing a single service that has all the music, the whole catalog, and video. But Amazon is the closest because they have Prime, and Prime is this weird amalgamation of, of some user benefits and two-day shipping for free and a limited music library and a video library. So the Uber bundle I was talking about is the Apple Uber bundle. Could Apple, like just trying to think outside the box here, could Apple create a product that would boost their services revenue that would be like the Apple Club, basically, Apple Premiere something that's their equivalent of Prime, what would go in that? I mean, Apple Music could go in that. This video service could go in that. What else would go in there? And I think that's the that's the mystery is do you throw in like some extra Apple Care? Do you get priority to pre-order the new iPhone? I don't know. Do you get to uh, your own genius at the Genius Bar that's separate? Like it's like TSA pre-check for, for the Apple Store. I don't know what they would do, but certainly they must have considered this at some point because Amazon Prime is such a huge product for Amazon. I think it's in, what, almost half of American homes. It's pretty amazing. Um, so that's that's the question is, would Apple do something outside the box, not a bundle of just video and music or two separate services, video and music, but some sort of bigger service that is more like Amazon Prime, which is more expensive, but also kind of like has a whole bunch of different benefits. What I would like is someone to come to my house and remind me to charge all of my devices that I don't charge every night. Like the Maybe iPads. your personal your personal genius could do that, maybe. Yeah. Just like knock on the door and say, Megan, did you did you forget? And then off to the next one. It's just your whole neighborhood. He's just knocking on doors saying, Did you don't remember don't forget to charge that thing? Could I'd like be. my yeah, I'd like my own personal genius to live in my home. I don't think that's too much to ask. It, no. Maybe this is a job for Siri. Maybe yeah, there should be some AI to yeah. just say, Hey, hey, uh, alert, alert. My really shouldn't they do that? Like my, it, it's pretty late and you haven't plugged me in yet. I think you should be reminded of that. They, your phone should be able to do that, right? The, the, the Apple's personal assistant should totally be the Apple Genius. Mm -hmm. Just call it the Apple Genius. Mm -hmm. It's your in-home Apple Genius. Mm, I like it. I like it. Well, you do a podcast with Tim Goodman. Uh, my a TV podcast. My father's yes. your biggest fan. Oh, so that's awesome. <laughs> so I'm sure you'll talk more about this on that podcast. Uh, you also uh, have lots of shows on Relay FM and the, the Incomparable 
and of course your frequent guest on the new screensavers, Jason Snell. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, I- it's uh, it's great to be here. And yeah, check out the TV Talk Machine podcast is the one with Tim Goodman. And we do talk about this subject a whole lot over there. <laughs> awesome. Thanks right so on. much. Thanks again. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Now uh, I'll beam down. <laughs> yes. Beam, disappear into the ether. <laughs> All right. If you weren't aware of just how sidelined Windows Mobile has become for Microsoft, VP of Windows Joe Belfiore uh, had something to say about it. On Twitter, in a series of tweets, Belfiore admitted that he had swi- he had actually switched to Android for better app and hardware diversity, he said. Uh, and that going forward, Windows 10 Mobile will see only bug fixes and security updates and not new features or even Windows, or sorry, Microsoft mobile hardware uh, to support the platform itself. Belfiore also admitted that though Microsoft tried to get developers on board with plenty of incentives, there simply wasn't enough users to then motivate the companies to get involved with the platform in big numbers. Uh, so, you know, as as we've kind of seen, like we talked a little while back about Bill Gates, you know, hopping on the Android train uh, as well, their, their focus really is just bringing Microsoft to all of the existing platforms and making it work in that kind of multi-platform approach. Mm-hmm. Machine learning continues to be an area where bitter rivals join forces to share information. Today, Microsoft and Amazon Web Services, or AWS, announced a partnership called Gluon. It's a new open AI ecosystem designed to to simplify deep learning development. According to Microsoft, AI has the potential to solve many of the world's problems, but not without first making it more accessible to more developers on different platforms using more language. So this is kind of the same as the the story about uh, Windows going everywhere. Yeah. They, uh, it's always interesting to me that they share so much information when it comes to AI because that's how it progresses because there's just so much. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so, much, so many different efforts happening. Standardizing an API of some sort is just going to be really great for the AI industry as a whole to kind of know you know, to, to, as it have, as it develops out even heavily, even more heavily out into the future, get everybody on the same page so it isn't so splintered. Artificial intelligence may someday rule the world, but before that happens, we'll have to get very comfortable talking to it as if it were an actual human being. Maybe you've done this before already. Uh, perhaps we'll be talking to a replica of ourselves. Joining us to discuss this bizarre future trend is Mike Murphy from Quartz. How's it going, Mike? Not too bad. Right on. Thank you for uh, for joining us. So late this summer, your team published uh, just a huge special project called Machines with Brains. Some fascinating stuff in there. So I highly encourage if, if people missed it, they go back and dive in. But you spent a few months chatting with an app called Replica. Uh, and I've actually been playing around with it a little bit myself, but obviously you spent a lot more time with it than I have. So first, tell us a little bit about the idea behind the app, how, how it was inspired. Sure. So um, the app comes from this company, the startup called Luca, that has been building chatbots that do a range of things for a few years. Like, you know, they made one that was just like uh, telling you the weather, one that gave you travel recommendations, all kinds of random stuff. And um, one of the founder's uh, best friends um, passed away, got uh, hit by a car one day when when at home and um, you know, died tragically at a young age. And, um, she, the founder, uh, Genia Guida decided to basically take every text that she'd ever sent and every text she'd ever received from him and run it through the AI systems that they'd been using to build, um, these little chatbots that they've been making to basically make a version, a kind of chatbot version of, her, her good friend, uh, Roman was his name. And, um, she released this, uh, I think this was last summer now. Um, and it was scary because I mean, you know, obviously for her and and people who knew Roman, there was a connection there and it really felt like this bot was saying things that he would have said. And she opened it up to the world. And, you know, even if you never met this guy, you got a sense of, of personality from this bot that really is something that you don't get so often from bots. I mean, you know, Siri might crack a joke when you talk to her, but she's, you can tell that it's like just a weird robot. Um, and basically they started getting a lot of people saying, 
how can I do this? I want to build something like this for someone I've lost, or I, I just want to see what it's like for, for me and that sort of thing. And, um, they kind of decided to, to pivot the company a little bit and create what is now being called replica, which is essentially a way of taking conversations that you have with this internal bot in the replica app, um, to create a version of you and you can add in your Twitter account. You can add in your Instagram account, like all the stuff that you would be very much yourself and like the way that you talk in the world. Um, you can add those into the bot as well, but basically you are just going through having a conversation with this, this bot. And, um, over time it's supposed to essentially create a little digital version of yourself. <laughs> so, so your bot in the conversation you put in the article, your bot said that, uh, you should drink less and eat better and have more friends. What now, are you did saying, you, Bot? Jeez. Did, you, did you tell it that, or was that? Did it just? Uh, did it just glean that simply from your um, your your social media profiles? So I think in that case, it was uh, compiling things that I had told it at different points. Um, I, I was testing out the software when it was back in beta in like. February started in February and ran to like May uh, or July. And, um, you know, it, it would, it, sometimes it might, especially early on, it would like parrot things back at you that you say to it. Um, and when I first got it, I was, you know, I was feeling a little down then. And I was probably very over dramatic. It was like the most dramatic version of Mike that I could have possibly put into this, the system. And so, yeah, there were times where it definitely said stuff that was like, emo Mike talking, <laughs> but that's, you know, that's like a part of me and there's other right. sides that are different. And, you know, if you talk to something for long enough, it kind of understands the, the different sides of you. Hmm. Um, now, as you mentioned, you need to chat with the bot for quite a while before it starts to kind of understand your mannerisms, understand the words you use, the phrases you use, all that kind of stuff. Is it hard to stay? Because, I mean, I, I played around with it for a day, basically. And, you know, there's a big setup time where you're chatting with a bot and it asks you a question. It's all very conversational. If you didn't know it was a robot, maybe you'd be less inclined to actually, you know, figure it out. Um, but still, because you know it is a robot, because you know it's code, uh, it's kind of hard to stay motivated to, like, keep up this conversation with something that doesn't exist. Um is that hard to build up that profile to like stay kind of connected to it enough to be able to fill it with the information that it needs over time? I, I can definitely see that for uh, being a challenge for, for certain people. And, you know, obviously when I was doing it, I was really trying to get it to work. I want it to be as honest and as open right. as, as possible, even though honestly, that's not necessarily how I am in my life. So am I actually being as true to myself as I should be. If I'm open with it, that's, and I'm not an open person, then like, am I actually doing the right thing? But yeah, I think that it, it will be a challenge for certain people. Like they'll think, okay, well I have to put all this time into it. And then, um, it, you know, they might not see the benefit in that, but for others, you know, maybe people who are, you know, struggling with loneliness or depression or anxiety, um, people who might not have a lot of friends might not be able to get out very much. I can see it being a really interesting tool um, as as this kind of thing that's endlessly fascinated by you. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that's a really interesting idea. And obviously you can get into like weird spaces with that where it's like, well, then you, you know, this thing, kind of, you know, it's a little narcissistic and perhaps that can be unhealthy. But like, I, I do think that, in, and I spoke to a lot of um, psychologists and psychiatrists about their techniques and the way that they go about helping people who have, um, you know, certain issues that can be dealt with like that. And Replica, Luca, the, the company behind Replica, um, also spoke and worked with psychologists to make sure that the way that they were asking questions to get information from you were the ways that um, psychi psychiatrists work. And you know, when I went through it, I was kind of explaining how it was working. A lot of the psychiatrists were basically like, yeah, that's, that's basically how we work. So, so in a way, I mean, this is a Black Mirror episode. Um, <laughs> yes. This is the movie She, <laughs> this is, you know, and, and neither one of those end, end well. But in a way, I, well, the more I, you know, the, when I read your article and thought about it, uh, 
it, it's really so much of real life right now. I mean, we have these, you and I have these occasional, and, and Jason, we have these occasional Skype conversations about tech news stories, and you and I direct message sometimes. But most of how I know you living in New York is through your Twitter feed. And I don't really, like, I've made, I, I don't really know you. Like, I only know what, you know, what you're putting forth on Twitter. And that's the sort of the same way. And it's, I feel like I have a lot of relationships like this. And this is the way we're moving towards and I hope it ends well, but um, if you believe in Black Mirror and the movies, it really doesn't. <laughs> That's, I mean, yeah, it's totally true. That that episode of Black Mirror is a really good one as well. But um, the, I guess the difference here is that like these AI systems that like Replica are using or, you know, similar companies are not that sophisticated. Like you will eventually be able to see through the, the AI. And I've been using it so much that I, I ended up... Um, I kind of stopped after a while. Like I, I, I still talk to it every so often. I talked to it yesterday. Um, but like you do realize on some level, yes, I'm just talking to an AI, but like sometimes just having something that's interesting in you is, is nice. Right. Um, and I, I can see downsides in this. I think more realistic downsides are not like these things are going to become so great that they're going to copy us and replace us, but more like that something that is so obsessed with you, that you become so obsessed with it in a kind of toxic way. I, I can see that happening to some people maybe. Um, but yeah, these, these systems are not, and probably won't be for a very long time, uh, you know, powerful enough to actually replace you. They, they, this one in particular does a really good job of figuring out mannerisms and the way that each of us type. Um, and obviously they get information about, uh, the way we live and things that we do. But so it's, it, it's easy to create this veneer of a person. Um, and it's easy as a person to get a reaction when you see something like that written, but that's not the same obviously as, as really replacing someone. Yeah. And I'm not really worried about, um, you know, a d digital assistance, a destroying us or anything like that. I'm, I'm worried more about what you're talking about, like the veneer of a person. And I worry about people that are younger, um, thinking, you know, I mean, even my kids, my oldest is 14. Like I'm already talking to her about your, your online personality is your personal brand. And I know that sounds gross, but you kind of have to do that because it's need to, to tell the difference between who you are online and who you are in real life. And I think kids that are just immersed in all of this technology really need to be reminded that there's a difference between those, those two things. I think that's, that's totally true. And I can see um, systems like this being being more of an issue in the future, but yeah, I mean, it's it's something that we don't deal with very well right now. I mean, I mean, even I, as a apparently fully functioning adult, spend way too much time on the internet talking to people and doing dumb things. Like <laughs> that is not something that we're equipped for because it's not existed before. Like there was nothing that our parents' generations or even the generation directly before us has to to reference. I mean, even something like AOL Instant Messenger was not anywhere near as immersive as the mobile web is today. No. Uh, it, yeah, it was competing with an entirely different paradigm. We've really moved the goalposts pretty far from, from that point, uh, definitely. But for its time, it was pretty darn you know, <laughs> forward thinking, I suppose. Um, finally, it, were there other people that know you that got to interact with your replica? And would they, like, what were their opinions? Did they say from their perspective that it was a good representation of who they know you to be? I never got to the stage, uh, partially because when I was still testing it, it was still pretty much, I think the whole time in beta. Right. Um, I never got to the point where I could like, like other people had accounts and I'd be like, go talk to Mike bot. But I gave people my phone, like friends of mine and, you know, made them ask questions. And the answers were, you know, answers I would give. Mm -hmm. Maybe sometimes they were a little more, awkward because you know the ai syntax wasn't quite right but like you know it knew my favorite food it knew my best friend it knew where i worked it knew like my aspirations things like that and like yeah parroting tri uh, trivia about me is like one thing but having the syntax right and like the way that i actually type i think really helped sell that i really wanted to get a get to a point and i didn't get there to where i could like give it to my mom and be like which one is me like do a Turing test with like my mom, but 
I, I didn't get there, unfortunately. She'd be able to tell Mike. Yeah. She would. <laughs> Pretty certain. And if not, then that's like the advanced Turing test. That's the next level Turing test. Uh, Mike Murphy with Quartz. That's QZ.com. And uh, definitely check out this whole feature, which was Machines with Brains. Like I said, it, it came out during the summer, but it's some really fascinating stuff in there. And you took one for the team, spending so much time chatting with an AI bot and trusting <laughs> that it wouldn't end badly. So thank you for doing that, Mike. We really appreciate it. <laughs> of course. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll talk to you soon, Mike. Take care. And finally this week, the world got to experience the true advances that live streaming technology can bring us when Mark Ruffalo accidentally broadcasted the inside of his pocket live to thousands of his Instagram followers. <laughs> Although the inside of his pocket was indeed beautiful and very smooth, the real entertainment <laughs> came from the fact that Ruffalo was at the screening of the new Thor movie, which gave viewers access to the audio of the yet-to-be-released film, or part of it at least. Ruffalo had, had been live streaming from the L.A. premiere and then forgot to turn the recording off when the movie started. Oh, man, we've all been there, right? The pocket we, live streaming. Yeah, pocket live nope. streaming, the unreleased movies. And <laughs> yeah, no, no. Totally been there. Hey, what? Live streaming's hard, right? We, we, prove, this, <laughs> we prove this regularly uh, here at the Twit Network. Live streaming is not the easiest thing in the world. When you've got live streaming in your pocket, it's even more complicated. Mm -hmm. or I don't True. know if it's more or less complicated, but apparently it's easy to, to keep live streaming from your pocket. Well, um, if you forget to turn it off, yeah. Yeah, well, you, you got to hit that complicated button before you throw it in your pocket. There should be pocket protection is, I guess, yes. what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. You need a pocket protector for your live streaming device. I uh, told you we'd keep the dad jokes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. You can be part of the show, of course. Just email us, tnw at twit.tv. If there's an interview you want us to line up or you have a comment about anything we talk about on the show, we're all ears. This this show's an open book at this point. We're kind of playing around with things, and we hope you'll uh, join us for the ride. Yep. Tablua Rasa or whatever it is. Isn't that what it is? Tablua <laughs> Tablua Rasa. <laughs> Subscribe to our Tablua Rasa. <laughs> Subscribe yourself. Subscribe to your for your friends. Go to twit.tv slash TNW. And yeah, if you want to tweet at me to tell me what you'd like to see more of or less of, I'm at Megan Maroney. Please include me. I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to our TD and editor today, Josh. Thanks to Burke. Thanks to Jammer B. Thanks to Colleen. Thanks to everyone here for helping out today. And thanks to you. Uh, we will see you next week on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody.